All right, we're gonna get started with this um, event. So I'm gonna ask my co-host to just stop the music. And hi everyone, thanks for joining us. This is Developers Roles in Localizing and Internationalizing Software Products. And it is part of the Growth Summit, uh, Developer Growth Summit 2022. And I just wanna give some quick uh, instructions. We're using Zoom webinar and it is completely normal that you can't see other attendees, however, Know that many of you are present, so feel free to interact through chat. Make sure to set the chat to send to everyone um, since it defaults to host and panelists, so you'd be sending it to us. You'll also notice a Q&A feature in the toolbar. It should be about here or here, depending on your screen. Um, this is where we're going to put all of our questions, so make sure not to type your uh, question in chat. Do it in the Q&A instead. And if you have questions, instead of raising your hand, please use a Q&A uh, Q&A feature as well. So that would be great, thank you so much. And now I wanna officially introduce Rufus, our speaker for the event. Rufus is a thought leader and co-founder of Disha. He joined Flutterwave as a senior software engineer after Disha's acquisition to ensure the platform's success. Without further ado, Rufus, please take it away. All right, thank, All right, you, so thank you. Um, um, thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, good. Good day, everyone. Um, whatever the time is where you're joining from. Afternoon. Good morning. Good. Good evening. As it can be. Uh, my name is Rufus, and um, I'm speaking from Lagos, Nigeria. Right. I'm going to be sharing my screen shortly, where uh, I'm going to like take us through, you know, um, strategies and best practices when it comes to globalizing product. Um, okay, um, share screen. All right. Um, I believe you can all see my screen now. Uh, so yes, once again, I'm Rufus and I'm joining from Lagos, Nigeria. I'm speaking from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, so yes, the purpose of the talk today is to actually uh, let us know, you know, developers' role, software engineers' role um, in globalizing, you know, uh, product. Uh, so when I say globalize, I mean internationalizing product and also localizing, uh, you know, software product and all that, right? Um, just as we all know in our career and so far, right? I'll be doing Netflix and you know different stuff, you know in mean, all over the world in different parts of the world and in different places right and um, yes that the desire of a software engineer but there is a couple of challenge you know um, that you know for us to actually actualize actualize that kind of goal that we need like um, kind of find a solution to right and what we have on screen is actually highlighting some of those challenge uh number one of them is um different time zones right um so right now everybody i'm currently speaking from Nigeria is in, is in taiwan um i can see people from kenya and people from different parts of the world as well right so Hi, what i'm trying to say in essence is so sorry, you're actually breaking off and the crowd can't really hear you very well. Is there another place you can maybe uh, try to set up your computer that's a little more stable? Oh, okay. Okay, uh, just just give me, give me a second. Yeah, no worries. Take your time. Thank you. We just don't want people to miss your, miss your, miss your talk. Sorry guys, we're just gonna wait for a couple minutes as uh, Rufus rejoins us so we can hear him speak more clearly. Um, if you're interested, um, you can also maybe answer one of Rufus's questions. For instance, have you worked with I18N and L10N in any of the products or services you've helped build? The question is in the chat. So sorry again for the technical difficulties.
Maggie, do you want to play some music for us in the in the meantime? <laughs> for us sure. to jam to a little bit. Give me a sec. All right. Here's some music for everyone. And Rufus, just let us know whenever you're ready. From Pranjaj, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, he shared that we recently introduced French into an unmined product using React 118 Next. Now we're facing the challenge of refining our process so that translations do not slow us down in releasing new features. That is definitely something I have ran into in the past as well. Thank you for sharing. Is it okay if I don't know what these products are? No, that's totally okay. Oh, okay, great. Rufus is back. So I'm going to hand the mic over to him. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry about the connection issue. Can we all see me and hear me louder, Claire? Um, still a little choppy, but let's give it a try. Okay. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen once again. Um, share and play okay um so I, I was saying earlier um that the goal we all desire to be like international products you know for like so many different users all over the world right but there's a couple of challenges we need to like overcome right and one like so i have about three of them so this three images we are currently seeing on the screen is meant to like depict you know some of these challenges which we'll be focusing on today and I'll also be sharing like best practices in terms of what you actually need to consider in order to build a product that is able to address some of these challenges that your user might be facing from any part of the world uh, so one of them is date and time zone right uh, like i said i'm currently speaking from lagos nigeria we have people in kenya we have people uh, you know, in different parts of the world on this Zoom call, um, this session, and also, you know, just the same way different users are going to be using your products in different parts of the world. Um, we all know the best products out there, um, the Zoom that we use, the Netflix and all of that. And, um, it is required that this product are actually built in such a way that uh, it takes care of everybody's, uh, you know, use cases wherever they might be joining from or using the product from. That is one, you know, date and time zone. Um, another challenge uh, that we as software engineers need to like tackle or fix is um, languages. So when I say languages. A lot of times everybody does not they don't speak english right um so we have people speaking french in other parts of the world we have portuguese and so Ili, arabic and so many other languages like that you know uh then just as way the same way they don't speak french or they don't speak english and they speak other languages is the same right so when we are building products back end front end we need to be conscious of some of these best practices which i'll be sharing later on and um while we are doing this right um so yes just a little bit of definition before i get right into it um so internet internationalization of product is is like a process you know of building your application of products to support multiple languages and reading and writing conventions, right? And um, in terms of, so sometimes people kind of mix it up, right? Because of um, the way the two kind of sound similar or when, when people hear localization and 
uh, internationalization of product they, they think of it like it's the same it's the same thing but there is um it, it's a bit different right so um a, a way i want us to think of it is um you know localization is a second step after you know after a product has been internationalized right um so the internationalization of products it's kind of something that happens at the point of you know planning you know uh, before the actual engineering of the product actually starts before before you start pushing picks like strategy and you know the part of it's part of the initial phase of the project when when it's being planned and map out, mapped out you know when architecture is being planned and all of that right and after all that is done the localization itself is what happens you know a, a, a step after you know after what happens at the initial stage of planning and that is when you know usually like developers and actual you know software engineers actually come in to actually work on some of these things right um what we currently have on the screen is like wall socket which to an extent i believe you are all familiar with and um depending on the part of the world you're currently joining from um some of this may be familiar or not familiar to you right and the reason why i'm sharing this is because this is actually you know this is a very i believe this is a very good way to actually understand this thing better how how all of this thing works and how it you know kind of works when it comes to product um so let's think of hardware products right when we when we talk about hardware products uh, you know, product that, you know, your electrical appliances that you have to plug at home to, to the wall socket and stuff like that, right? At the point of actually developing an, an hardware product, one of the things that needs to be taken care of at the initial stage, um, at the point of, you know, drain like the electrical circuit, I mean, before even getting to that part, at the point of planning, is okay. how many contracts are we going to be shipping uh, And that is the internationalization part of this. And um, the reason why they need to actually take note of this at that stage is so that software, for example, you know, let's let's take TV for example, a TV that's license, right? And all that needs to the point of you know at the point of you know planning you know the product itself before the work actually starts. You know, that is step one. Then step two is you know the engineers we have. To actually be conscious of something at the point of actually building the product. And as they are factoring that into the board, they're also factoring it into you know the wall socket, the cable that comes with these electrons so it is so that when they ship this product to any part of the world, so they ship it to the UK or to the US, um, the user there is able to buy this product and just plug it into the power mains without having to do so many or without having to worry about so many things right so that is the part where localization comes to play so the the thing is is the same thing with standards that needs to be met they consider those standards based on region and locality and factor that into the you know the phase of actually building the software product um, so yes, in short, uh, internationalization, like I said, is actually getting the product world ready and localizing the product, right? So the, the whole outcome of the process of making the product world ready you know for like a global market a well internationalized you know product yes uh, so i'm just going to be getting into like you know some of these and um like i see the best practices and you know 
take note of you know regional standards and requirements right one is more specific in terms of you know focus is now on what are like specifically be you know word ready and to be globalized right so um the goal of you know internationalization is to ensure that a product is localizable you know doing it in such a way that if this product is going to be used in any other part of the world we just need to make a few adjustments around there to ensure that it's actually ready for the global market while localization gets into like specific things like okay language translation you know local specific components like your currencies images symbols you know right to test right to left language support you know units you know so when we say units you know measurements units you know imperial versus metric depending on the part of the world and stuff like that and also you know rigor requirements uh, based on these different features so that is what localization focuses on right um there's a lot of process involved in all of this but in all right there's going to be like a whole different um, entities involved uh, from start to finish. So when I say entities, there's going to be need for like a transition expert. There's going to be need for like a product manager that foresee this um, at the initial stage and planning, uh, you know, sprint planning and all of that. You know, there's also the um, need for how do I say it? There's also requirement. Um, there's also it's also going to be a designer may also be required. A software engineer may also be required, and that is where we come in. You know where we come in, right? So uh, the essence of this talk is to help us know in our team what is going to be required of us to actually build a well international in and um, you know factoring all of that in and knowing what is expected of us as a software engineer to actually do when it comes to you know these things right so yes narrowing down like i said i'm going to be focusing on you know three things and uh, the first one is encoding and data storage right so um you know whatever we are building right now there's need for a back end there's need for like a data storage you possibly have a database management software somewhere you know that stores all your user data and whatever kind of data you're capturing right and what I have here is like a list of okay things to actually consider as software engineers to actually, you know, ensure that uh, product is well globalized, right? So one of them is is to use Unicode um, chassis when when you know planning the database. So at the point of you know planning your migration files or you're doing your database schema and all of that. So your tables and columns where necessary, where you're going to be storing users input, uh, needs to like use UTF-8 or you know, Unicode as, as the, the reason for this is because so that you can actually support wide range of text and input. So when I say support, um, I'm saying support in terms of, um, say somebody in the uk is entering their name in english uh, when somebody is also entering their first name in, in and they are using the products from dubai um they would have to they may write their name in arabic right and we need to be able to store that safely in database and also retrieve it when we need to right and that is why we need to actually ensure that we're using the proper character sets for columns and tables you know in in the db engine that is currently powering the product on the front end side of things as well uh it is one thing to actually store the data in the database in a format that you know we can easily retrieve without losing you know any of the characters right and on the front end as well we also need to ensure that we are like Unicode compatible fonts. So it is not every, every font out there or type based that actually supports, you know, this plain like, you know, um, 
languages, um, some are non Latin ready and stuff like that. That uh, and you know, so users route they track right? when they are split one way to ensure that is actually by using like a very good font. Um, um in HTTP either when a session you are developing like API. Hello, Rufus. Do we still have you? Oh, hello, Rufus. Hello. Uh, I think you're muted. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I think you are just a little spotty. No, we can't hear you again. Um, you're very, very spotty. Um, do you want to try turning off the camera for a little bit? Oh, sorry about that. You can hear me now? Oh, okay, um, sure. Yeah, we can hear Is you better. better. Okay, can, can we see my screen, please? Yes, yes, yeah. this is much clearer. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, sorry about the connection issue. Um, so moving on to the next one. So I, I was talking um, about Chasset using UTF-8 in HTTP headers, and I was saying that this is mostly applicable to um, APIs. You know, um, so my API responses needs to like, you know, we need to, where applicable, this should be like the part of like, you know, the endpoint response, you know, header and all of that. Um, the next thing we have here is date and time zone. And like I said, uh, people are going to be using the product from different parts of the world. And um, we need to ensure that we are actually handling date and time properly. So for example, we all use Google Calendar. Um, you go Calendar today, if I'm to schedule a meeting with somebody um, that is in Taiwan, for example, once I'm scheduling a meeting for 4 p.m. my time, it automatically changes the time to the person's time from their hand. And that is because they are kind of handling the date and time zone properly, right? And um, my recommendation for this is to actually store the time in the database at, in UTC. And I mean, UTC is like, you know, you, the, the universal time zone, right? Like the central one, right? Storing it in the, data, in the database in that format. However, on the front end, when retrieving and when we need to now display it to the user, we can now detect or hack for the user's time zone. So as a case, maybe either detect or get them to actually set their time zone. I'm on GMT plus one, I'm on, you know, CAT plus three and different time zone like that or PST. And um, now be able to actually pass the dates we've stored in UTC and format it in the, in the format that is actually relevant to that particular zone, right? Um, we all know that there are different date formats. So we might be showing year first, year, month, and day, or day, month, and year. I mean, this kind of differs uh, from one part of the world to the other. So that can be handled on the front end side of things. So the logic is, you know, storing the database, storing the date time as UTC in the database at the point of retrieving and displaying it back to the user. We are now converting it to the user's time zone right and also now displaying it in the format that is applicable to that particular time zone right then the next thing we need to also have is like i said the applic our application should be able to like detect time zones or users should be able to like set their time zone in the application and this is what i mean so take for example let's say your application actually sends birthday reminders to people right uh, we need to be able to, you know, 12 midnight or let's say Happy New Year message to people, right? Uh, meanwhile, Happy New Year in Nigeria is different from Happy New Year in Australia and it's different from Happy New Year in Canada, right? So we need to be able to, in like a cron job or the scheduler that is running and stuff like that, in any scheduled task, uh, scheduled task 
uh, whatever, um, we should be able to take note of Jesus' time zone, right? So for a notification that needs to go out at 12 midnight Nigerian time, so that needs to be, for a user that is in Nigeria, that actually needs to be considered. For a notification that needs to go out, you know, um, you know, 8 a.m. in Canadian time or U.S. time needs to actually, you know, or particular time zone in U.S. needs to be able to send a particular notification at that particular point in time. So we need to actually consider that usually in scheduled task as well. Um, the amazing thing about some of these tool, uh, I mean, some of these things, some of these standard is that um, there are libraries already that kind of you know makes it easy already right so when i say libraries we have moment js if you write node or express or inside express we have you know carbon if you you know write php we have this util write python or ruby on rails and we have like different you know libraries that allows you that helps you format time and actually pass time as as required you know as, as well um yes the third thing the third focus area we have here is language translation right so you know this is a part where we actually take all the text in our application and ensure that they are translated in all the languages the application is going to support Right. So uh, when I say support, we so I mean that is going to already pre is going to be predetermined. So who are our target users? So are they speak speaking English? Are they speaking French, Swahili, Arabic, and different languages and different languages like that? Right. So we need to be able to have all the text that is within the application, all the user facing text. Um, you know, removing it from the code and ensuring that they are well, you know, translated, right? For different languages, again, there are different libraries that actually um, handles all of this already for us. And even frameworks come ready with some of these things already, right? So there's actually no need for us to reinvent the wheel, you know? Um, my recommendation here as well is also to actually use like, you know, separate JSON file for, you know different languages that the application is going to support so you know you might be so you might have like a, a file that is called hngb.json uh, what this means is the language is english the local is you know gb for the uk speakers and you know then the file extension because the, the reason for this convention is because though there is english language english language as a language, for example, also varies between countries and regions. So there's US English, there's you know UK version, and you know different things like that. And we need to be able to like you know have like proper languages, uh, language files that actually take note of those translation for those regions. Uh, the next thing I think we also need to consider as software engineers is also you know how we are going to how this is going to fit into you know continuous deployment for our application so when i say continuous deployment i mean so if i need to make a change to a text in my in my application right i shouldn't have to build the application all over again ideally um if i need to so say a text is incorrect or we're changing a word right one shouldn't have to like build an application whole from the beginning again and push to production because of language change right um if i need to add an extra text i need to have a way to actually ensure you know how that is done as seamless as possible so and that's why i have you know it's usually recommended that they use like a transition api so when i say transition api so that can be like an existing third party service like google translate or you know building like a custom transition api you know a custom transition api that serves like your transition management system where you have your language keys and the translations in all the different languages that you're going to support so that way whenever you want to make a change to your application that does not involve like a new translation key you just want to change from hello to welcome right you won't have to you know build the entire application again it will just be a case of you know going to the trans the language translation uh, management system or the api service you have and making the change 
in there, right? And also, like I said, don't forget, like right to left, you know, modifications on the front end as well. Then uh, some other things to also take note of is accounting localization. So currency, the way it's displayed in regions is different. Um, you know, thousand separators when I'm displaying numbers is also need, needs to also be taken care of. So if you are building like a fintech product, for example, um, when at the point, so after storing my, you know, numbers in the database and maybe float or double or whatever data type you used, it, you need to also ensure that, you know, on the front end, it is rendered in such a way that is applicable to that particular locale that the user is using the product for. So an accounting software for people in the part of the world may have comma as a thousand separators, while in other places may actually be dot as the case may be. Um, so yes, um, so I have this slide here that just shows like a little code snippet. You know, at the end of the day, um, I mean, after all of these things, there are actually, it all, it, it all boils down to like having like, you know, two different types of developers or software engineer, right? The ones that actually had coded their text in what they are building or the ones that are actually using the language translation feature of the framework they are currently using, right? So as software engineers, it is recommended that, you know, we do this at the initial stage, at the point of planning uh, the product, at the point of building, not waiting till when the product is ready before all of these things is put into place, because um, this is going to save us time. And the beauty about this is once you have this ready in the product, um, say you need to add a new translation or you need to support a new locale, um, this is like a very, the process is not very seamless because it is more or less just adding an extra thing to your language translation, you know, service or, or changing a few things here and there, you know, instead of, you know, doing all of that all over from the beginning, if you didn't do this at the point of building the product initially, right? So, yes. So the question is, which one is it going to be, you know? Um, and as, as you're building products, as you're writing code, which, which, what kind of developer are you going to be? You know, is it the type that, you know, put the text in there or the one that actually, you know, put the translation text in there? You know, it's actually better to say, I'm writing an application in English and I have my translation in, you know, I'm using the translation feature of the framework I'm using. And I only have an English file. You know, so that way is like translation ready. So whenever I'm, I'm it's actually more seamless. It's just more or less adding like you know translation file and all of that. Yeah. So yes, that's that's all I have. Uh, I believe my time should be up by now. Uh, sorry for the connection glitches here and there. Um, and um, thank you so much for joining the call. And um, I mean the session. I'm ready to take the questions and answers that uh, we may have right now. Thank you. Great. Um, we're gonna, Rufus, do you mind unsharing your screen and then maybe just popping back on with the video? I think maybe, maybe we'll get people to see your face a little bit. Yes, I'm just going to do that. Okay. All right. Can everyone see Rufus clearly? Cool. Okay. We're gonna jump into the first question from Pran, uh, Pranjaj. Um, I, Pranjal, I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing her name incorrectly, feel free to uh, correct me later. Um, so he said, um, he or she, I'm so sorry, they said, at my company, we have recently made our product multilingual. Now we're facing the challenge of refining our process so that translations do not slow us down in releasing new features. Any tips on how we could achieve this? Okay, um, that's the part I talked about having like a translation management system, you know, that kind of has all your translation. So you have your key and you have all your translation text in the various language that you support. So that way, so think of it like a translation API for your application. So that handles just translation. So uh, you're storing the keys in the database and the trans or the text that you have in your application. So that way, 
uh, whenever you are adding a new language, for example, we are picking from, so you are possibly, you're basically making a, an API call, a, a, a DB lookup, where you are picking all the translations, I mean, all the languages in your DB or via your API, right? And also now loading, you're also from there, you're loading all the translation keys and the values right into like a JSON file. So think of it like an API service that has like two endpoints, one or two basic endpoints, basically one that returns all your languages that you're currently supporting. So that is what you know comes to the user as an option to actually select from. Then another API that returns the keys and the values of that particular language um, that the user has selected, right? Um, so yeah. Just a basic one. Ideally, if you want to expand that, possibly you need to have like language translation, uh, language translators on your team that needs to make modifications. We now need to also have like separate endpoints that allows you to, to perform like crude on your transition API. So like crude operations. So you should be able to like create new keys, you know, rename keys, update keys, or delete keys as the case may be. But on the basic, you know, two endpoints returns all the languages that you're currently supporting and also second endpoints that returns the keys and the values of the language that you know you want to fetch yeah so i believe that will actually help you so that way you've kind of decoupled that from your application so you're building your focus you're focused on building other functionalities and once you want to make any change you're just making it to the transition api because that is where all your keys and values are stored Thank you. I hope I answered your question. I can't hear you, Jennifer. Your mic is muted. I'm so sorry. That was my bad. <laughs> All right. um, we have a question from Coyote or Coyote. I'm very sorry once again if I can't pronounce your name correctly. Um, what would you say is the major factor for the success you recorded with Disha? Sorry, take that question again. What would you say is the major factor for the success you recorded with Disha? Hmm. Um, success we recorded with Disha, I would say uh, partnership. Oh, sorry. I think, uh, I think so you're I think cutting partnership off again. Is because, you know, when myself and my co-founder, Oh, sorry. Oh, I think Can you hear me? Uh, maybe maybe Hello? pause your video again. again. <laughs> Seems like the internet has is just not really cooperating with us today. Okay. All right. Um, I believe you can hear me now. Um, so I, I was saying that um, success with Disha, I would say, is partnership. Um, so when we were starting the product, we had like uh, I partnered with you know. Um, key people to lead like you know major roles uh, that we feel is required for the success of the product so we are like a design lead that actually handles like everything designed well while I lead while I led you know technology I'm still leading technology of dish out for the wave and also we had partner with someone like a third co-founder that actually handled marketing so um, so I would say it's partnership basically you know getting the best and for the job you know, I was leading engineering with a couple of other guys on my team, back-end, front-end engineers. Uh, someone was handling like prototyping, everything that has to do with the design. And while someone was also leading like market, right? So those were like, I mean, those are like the key major, like uh, major in uh, when we're building. So I would say uh, that enabled us build faster, and you know, and also to actually launch, you know, better and all of that. So I, I think partnership is one major. Um, thing that actually helped us with. Okay, great. Um, oh, so sorry, Rufus. I think I accidentally cut you off because of the voice, the, the internet issue. Um, 
Since we're close to time, we're actually going to ask one more question. Um, Rufus, can you hear me clearly? Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. So we have a question. Actually, we have a few. So we're going to try to uh, maybe answer two more. The first one is from Ernest, or, or yes, Ernest. Hi, Rufus. This is really awesome. For languages that are not popular, like Chibenza, Chibemza, and Zambia, are there any libraries that would support such languages to build for such communities? Or would I need to recreate the wheel by creating my own language translating API? Hi, Jennifer. Hi, yes. I can hear you, please continue. Oh, okay, so um, I'm gonna read it again. For languages okay. that are not popular like Chimbenza, Chibenza, Chibemza in Zambia, are there, are, are there any libraries that would support such languages to build for such communities? Or would I need to recreate the wheel by creating my own language translation API? Um, so that sounds like, so, so I may be wrong, right? The language sounds like a dialect. Uh, in Nigeria as well, we have like over 200 languages in code and uh, there's like general one that people speak with. So speaking of, you know, the changes that need to happen in terms of technology, um, I would say you may need to actually, so it's not recreating the wheel, uh, but you're just building that something, you're building something that helps you develop faster, right? So you may need to have like your own language translation API, right? So but you're not translating real time. It's not like you have, it's not like you're building a Google Translate that actually translates, you know, that uses machine learning to do the translation. It's more or less, you know, you have all the languages, um, all the text string you want to translate and getting a translator to actually translate that for you. Then you're storing that in your language translation API, right? This is usually even recommended because in most cases, using like you know apis like google translate is not always like correct so sometimes usually even required to actually get someone speaking the language to you know actually handles all of the translation so you may actually need to build um have your own language translation api but it is meant to just store your text your keys and the values that you want to render based on you know users you know um selection in your in your application Okay, great. Um, we actually have two more questions, but we're only going to get to one. So I'm going to ask my co-host to pick one for me. <laughs> There's okay. one from anonymous attendee and Jia Yu. Oh, looks like Maggie already picked Jia Yu. So I'm going to read Jia Yu's out. I believe Jia Yu is in Taiwan and I believe I might know her. <laughs> um, all right. So her question is for startup products. How do you balance between dev time and speed when it comes to localization? I worked on a startup product. We didn't prior, prioritize localization at the very beginning. So it was really a pain when we headed to new markets. Okay. Um, so uh, I think that brings me back to why I said earlier that this needs to actually be, you know, it, it's better to plan your application and be ready for, you know, localization and internationalization and not need it at all, than, than not putting it in place and having to go back to the entire code to actually put it in place. It's actually a lot of work, right? I've been there before in, the, in another application like that as well, right? So uh, what I would recommend here is um, for, like I said, it should, it should be part of like the key consideration already before you start writing any code at all, right? That way, so think of it like I need to have trans I need to be translation ready, and I'm having English as the only language for now, right? So if you, even if you don't get to have another language down the line, it is good, right? It will not take you so much time to add a new language, and uh, instead of going all the way and having to come back to you know going through your code remove all the strings and actually now start making all the necessary modifications and all of that. So I would, I would say it should be part of your planning. And if you're not involved in the planning of a product, I would recommend that before you actually 
you know, start writing any code, if it wasn't part of like the roadmap, I, as, as a software engineer, I would say you should, you know, recommend that to the team. Uh, this is what takes like, this is what makes a difference, you know, between like a junior engineer and a senior engineer and all of that, you know, you should be able to like recommend, you know, best practices if you're starting a new project, right? And this wasn't part of the consideration. Yeah, thank you. I muted again. <laughs> yeah. Due to time, we're gonna wrap up the event here, but if we didn't get to your question, feel free to reach out to Rufus after the talk. Um, before we officially end, Rufus, do you have any final thoughts or encouragements? And everyone, please stay for a few moments after Rufus gives us his encouragements and words of wisdom. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining this session. Really appreciate. It. And once again, apologies for all the inconsistencies with connections. Um, again, like I said, uh, this should be part of your planning. Like anything translation or localization or internationalization should be part of your planning. It shouldn't be an afterthought, right? And this is what actually makes a difference between you know, a junior and a senior person. And like I said, you know, the same way we argue about or tabs or spaces, it's the same way we should, you know, like I shared the code, there are only two kinds of developers, right? The ones that actually enters their actual test into the application and the ones that actually plans for localization already and, and to, you know, takes care of that in the code as well. So yeah, um, I, I hope this has been very insightful. Thank you so much for joining the session. I really appreciate everyone. I think I saw a question somewhere, someone asking me if I'll be sharing my slides. Yes, I will definitely be doing that. Um, I'm going to be sharing with Jennifer. I'm going to, uh, um, yes, yeah, so that she can possibly add it to the YouTube link or whatever this is hosted and so that we can access later on. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer as well. Thank you, Maggie. Thanks for everyone. Thanks for having me, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, Rufus. So before we close the room, I have a few, uh, a, a few, what is that word I'm looking for? A few announcements to make. <laughs> so just a quick reminder that we do have a swag giveaway going. So we encourage you to share any learnings or questions from the social, the session on social. So make sure to tag Rufus and tag us and use the hashtag DGS2022. I know we have a, a member here, Mina, who has attended probably all of our events. So we really appreciate that. And quite a few people have tweeted a lot. Um, so we really appreciate that. Um, also, if you'd like to be a speaker, really anyone can be a speaker if you've had experience. So we really encourage that. So if you're interested in becoming a speaker um, and to share your experience with fellow developers, please check out Code Mentor Events homepage. All the links are in the chat. And again, if we have non-developers here, also, if you think the topics you're interested in speaking about has something to do with developers, feel free, right? All right. So um, as you know, there will be more events coming up after this. I'm actually going to ask Maggie to pull up the slides um, for the next event. And I believe that event is starting in, Maggie, help me out, two hours, one hour? <laughs> one hour or two hours? Let me check real quick. Um, Yes, it's happening in an hour. So get ready for that. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep this room open for another five minutes with some information showing. And after that, we'll be closing the room for just reset and everything until the next event starts. So check out all the links in chat and the slides um, here for the information and feel free to just stay for a little bit um, and make sure if you do share something, um, tag both Rufus and us. Rufus and us, us as in code mentor. My shirt, code mentor. <laughs> you can see it on the screen. Thank you so much, everyone. Feel free, if you still have other questions and you want to stay for a little bit, we can get to um, one or two more questions, Rufus, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. I'm still, still having a awesome. good time. Then I'm gonna just read one more question um, from anonymous attendee. How do we manage fonts for different languages since certain language encodings may not be supported in the default fonts which we use for English language? Okay, uh, yes, so I, I mentioned that we need to, so there are, there are fonts or typefaces that actually takes care of a wide range of languages. 
uh i will start with that first right so i would recommend you start with that that is one and also the amazing thing about css or or you know when you're importing language files is you're able to like import multiple files and have back uh, you know you're separating them by common so if i'm setting font family for my entire body font right i can set you know the first font to be like the you know, this is my primary font that I want everything to add in. Comma, another font as well, uh, which can support, you know, that can serve like a, it usually serves like a fallback font, you know, on, you know, on the internet. So I would, I would say you should choose a font that, you know, that is, that takes care of as many languages as possible. And don't forget to set your, you know, fallback font where necessary so that your browser will automatically use that for, you know, the necessary test on the screen. Thank awesome. You. Thank you so much, Rufus. And I think that's, we're going to wrap up the, the event today. Thank you guys so much for joining. And again, we're going to close this room in about 30 seconds time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Rufus. everyone. Thanks so Thanks, much. Jennifer.